Let's talk about oxygen balance now. This is a strange calculation. Okay, you have this sort of classic uh, combustion reaction, but notice this one doesn't have oxygen on the left. This molecule is uh, is decomposing to produce CO2, water, nitrogen, and oxygen, and this oxygen number could be negative. If it's negative, then you need oxygen on the left, right? But if it's positive, you have all the oxygen you need plus more. And so let's figure out what this oxygen number would be. And so for nitroglycerin, here's the formula for nitroglycerin. You have three carbons, five hydrogens, nitrogen, and oxygen. So three nitrogens and nine oxygens. Um, so this is nitro groups stuck on there. We'll see a picture of the molecule later. And so we put it in this equation, we generate uh, the three carbons make three CO2s, the five hydrogens make five halves water, okay, and then there's some nitrogen, so you have three halves of the nitrogens, and then the oxygen, okay, how much is it? So we have nine moles of oxygen on the left, so why do you follow that? That's easy. We have six moles of oxygen here for the CO2. And we have five halves oxygen here, so 2.5 moles of oxygen here. And then how much O2 is needed to balance this out? So I have six, seven, eight, and a half, eight and a half moles of oxygen, okay? And that's not equal to nine. So I get eight and a half, I add another half a mole of O, which is a quarter mole of O2. So this has a positive number here. So we have 0.25 moles of O2 excess in nitroglycerin. And that is really, you know, why it is just so sensitive and so complete in its combustion. So you hit it with that hammer, it's complete detonation. There's no carbon left, no uh, nitrogen and so on. It's all CO2, water, nitrogen, and a little bit of O2 <laughs> coming off. So there's actually O2 coming out of that reaction a little bit. Now TNT is also an explosive. It also detonates. But if you'll notice here, here's TNT, seven carbons, five hydrogens, uh, three nitrogens, and six oxygens. So up here, nitroglycerin has nine because it's nitro, uh, nitro groups, and these are um, uh, nitrate groups, and these are nitro groups. So doing the oxygen balance, we have six, and then we have 14 oxygens from the CO2, two and a half oxygens from the water, and then you add those up, so we have 14, 15, 16 and a half, 16 and a half moles of O, and how do we get that to equal uh, six? Well, we have 10 and a half too many on the right, okay? And so we need to take away 10 and a half uh, oxygens to get it to balance six. Now, 10 and a half moles of O is five and a quarter moles of O2. And so we see we have a deficit. This is a negative number to get this to balance with the six. And because it's a negative number, that means we're, we're deficient in oxygen. That doesn't mean it won't detonate, but it does mean it won't detonate as vigorously as it could. Okay. So this uh, TNT will actually leave behind some residue which could be evidence. Okay. It can leave behind carbon, it can leave behind, but most of the time it's carbon, it's just unreacted carbon. And since carbon needs the most oxygen and it doesn't have it, you're gonna starve the carbon for oxygen. You're not gonna form as much CO2. That doesn't give you as much energy out of that explosion because CO2 is a gas and carbon graphite is solid. Okay, so you're not gonna get as much power out of TNT so even though TNT is sort of our reference explosive, there are explosives that have a higher energy than TNT. But we use TNT equivalents to rank explosives. So some explosives might be 1.25 TNT equivalents. So one gram of that explosive is equivalent to 1.25 grams of TNT. We use that for our nuclear explosives too. So they'll say this particular device is one kiloton but yet it only weighs a couple of hundred pounds. <laughs> so you have an 800 pound object that is equivalent to 1.2 thousand tons of TNT. 
So this TNT is our a good reference explosive for explosive power, and uh, and even it is deficient in oxygen. So you take the ratio, this oxygen balance of 5.25 moles of oxygen divided by the mo the molecule's mass, and it's, it's negative 0.74 or negative 74 percent, whereas uh, nitroglycerin is four percent positive. Yes. Is this how they calculate whenever they do a controlled explosion, whenever they want to? Down a building or something? For taking down the building, they will use shape charges to cut. And so uh, you can direct the energy of the explosion by changing the geometry of the explosive. So uh, this, this <laughs> video that we didn't watch, which I'd love for you to watch um, on your own. Oh gosh, all these little box. <laughs> Um, but it's in the er earlier part of the notes. Let's go to let's go to two. Okay. Okay, this bottom one here, the shape charge. They send a little copper needle through about a foot of steel, all the way through it. Yeah, with an explosion. So they they can take. Um, metal cones and metal angles and they put explosives on the top and they can create knives and drills out of the metal. So they can put the shape charges on the structural beams for a building and just cut them. And then the weight of the building drops straight down. Because again, F equals MA, right? If there's no lateral forces to that building, it's not going to go side to side. It's going to go straight down. So you just cut the bottom of the building and then it just crushes itself the way the building crushes itself. One thing too is a lot of the heat, you know with the carbon tetrachloride, you throw it on there, some of the heat's consumed evaporating the carbon tetrachloride and then there's chemical losses due to breaking the carbon chlorine bonds. The evaporating and decomposing are endothermic. So decomposing the wax in a candle, that's endothermic. And, and it takes heat away from the system. Evaporating liquid is endothermic. And so it will stay at the boiling point of that liquid. So carpet, if you pour fuel on a carpet, then the fuel has to evaporate before it can burn. And that carpet is not going to decompose at the boiling point of that liquid. Think about the boiling point of a liquid. It's not that hot. And so if you have a fuel fire here and you burn it, and then later it, it runs out of heat or the heat dissipates and it quits burning kind of like that cotton ball did then in the middle you may have an unburned piece of carpet so here's an unburned piece of carpet and then here's also a liquid that's flowed into the carpet that hasn't burned yet and so you'll be able to find whatever was used to set that fire like you can sample that quickly get it into a metal can an arson can and send it to the lab and so if they saw a donut pattern, this is, looks like a donut burn pattern, that's like a bright red flag, this was arson, or an accident, somebody spilled a gallon of gasoline in their living room. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> 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 yeah. But if you're looking at the living room and next to it's like a Harley Davidson motorcycle and he's got the transmission taken apart in the living room, it happens, right? <laughs> then it might be a legit story, you know? Because you know, people do weird things. But if you just got a house with no motorcycle and a gallon of gas poured on the carpet, probably arson. You look at the totality of circumstances. And if you can sample that carpet piece in the middle, put it in a can, and later on we'll talk about techniques for desorbing that and getting it onto a gas chromatograph and so on. Um, in fact, I have an arson investigator coming to talk to you all. While I'm at the conference on March 2nd, um, I have a fellow from, I think he's from Montgomery County, Fire Department coming to talk about how they collect arson evidence, what they look for when they go into a fire scene. So he's a firefighter, but also an arson investigator. So he'll come and discuss those things with you. And I need to get somebody who's savvy to set up the video so I know what he says, so that I can test you on what he said. <laughs> so, okay. It's April 2nd? Mm -hmm. You said March. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you'll see these burn patterns too. We talked about the ceiling. You'll see char go from this, this V pattern. It's really kind of, it points to the source of the fire. 
you see the smoke damage, you can follow it along and find the source of the fire. And so, um, you know, you can also look in the ceiling and see these charred regions. And so next time we'll get into deflagration to detonation, what we call DDT, this transition, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss explosives in more detail.